Welcome to the Times of Industry show and today is a special one. You know, I'm not a US citizen, but if there was ever a reason to apply for a citizenship is because it allows you to go to the ballot and vote for Ron Paul in the past and now uh, for his son Rand Paul. Ron Paul, Dr. Ron Paul is 82 years old, but as you can see, he's not hanging his jersey anytime soon. Very active on all fronts. He's been in Congress since 1976 up until 2013 with very few breaks in between all for the state of Texas uh, where I happen to be at the moment myself three times he ran for president 1988 2008 and 2012 his stations in life contain many interesting periods with one common thread he has been a champion for upholding the Constitution in its entirety dr. dr. Paul Ron um, great to have you with us sir how's life how's everything well, doing well, and thank you for having me on, so it's good to visit with you. Uh, my first question to you is one which I've never asked anyone else, but it seems to fit like a glove in this case. In today's America, for the, for, you know, for the past 30 to 60 years here, since the, the World War II, there's a grand move away from the Constitution, away from limited government, away from freedom of speech, away from gun rights, from gold ownership, from any principles... Uh, that were brought about by the Founding Fathers. You've lived in this democracy your entire life. You've been in the minority um, that, that, that wants to preserve this uh, all throughout your life. Is democracy the best solution for at least, in my estimation, uh, 20 million Americans who want to live uh, by the Constitution? And how how is it to see this change uh, going through through your life and not be able to convince voters or, or citizens that they're forking away their natural rights and, and allowing government to have more control over their lives? Well, when I think in those terms, some days are better than others because I like to think of myself as an optimist that we're making progress. Actually, I date some of our problems either further back because there were significant changes made in 1913 when they introduced the notions of the, the universal income tax and then also the Federal Reserve System inflating the currency and us uh, accepting this obligation that we should be the policemen of the world. But after World War II, certainly I think that is a period of time when things were changing uh, rapidly and ever since. And that was, uh, you, you know, the realization that the welfare state was also introduced, you know, in the 30s and that we were totally dependent on it. But the government uh, definitely has been uh, growing uh, by leaps and bounds, still is. There's no concern for deficits. Uh, there's no concern for the size of government, whether you have Republicans or Democrats. It's always more spending, even with some uh, minor changes that have been beneficial with this administration, you know, with taxes and regulations, not on the front of spending money. There's, there's too many proposals for new money, which means they still endorse this Keynesian notion that uh, deficits don't matter and uh, we don't have to worry about it as long as we can maintain central banking and people believe in the dollar and they believe in us as the protector of the world, they will accept us. And they have. They have accepted us uh, you know, at, at face value, and we get away with it. But uh, we're not getting away with it uh, much longer. I think the, the real problem that we're facing today, why people are so angry and upset, is I think uh, whether they know it consciously or subconsciously, they know there's something seriously wrong. So they get to blaming, and it becomes a personality fight and a fight over power. But the truth is, is uh, I believe we live in a, at a time when we're seeing the winding down of our whole uh, ec economic system. I mean, or the Keynesian model, just as, as the Soviets finally collapsed in 89-90 and nobody really predicted. I think we're, we're facing that, that this whole system we have is not viable and everything I see currently and on the horizon is the loss of confidence in, in America, uh, providing uh, a, a truthful leadership with sound money and free markets and, and uh, not wanting to tell other people what to do. So I think it definitely has changed and that, that's why we live in very dangerous times. Now, you know this plays into my next question because the middle class points a finger at multinational corporations and U.S. political leaders for the downside of globalization, for outsourcing manufacturing, for uh, going on you know, war after war in the 20th century and in the 21st, and in this um, move to suck dry 
all of the middle class by outsourcing to slave labor countries and basically creating a wealth uh, effect for multinational corporations, uh, expanding the empire, but uh, obviously shrinking the wealth owned by the citizenry. Uh, I have basically two questions with regards to this. If US, U.S. companies, such as the car manufacturers, the clothing brands, the industrial businesses, all the other sectors which have operations in the Far East, in Central America, and Africa, if they weren't the ones initiating and leading this globalist agenda to boost their margins by keeping the headquarters in, in first world countries and putting everything else in the third world, won't the Europeans have done it anyways? W wouldn't this have happened um, with or without U.S. policies uh, opening borders? Well, I think so, but I think everything is driven by, uh, you know, ideas. Uh, they wouldn't do well if they didn't come around to accepting some of the basic principles that made our country great, and that is sound money, limited government, free market, uh, 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 you know, setting of uh, interest rates and property rights and, and contracts. Uh, if they accept that, yes, because what we have done to ourselves is undermine that system that has made us great. You know, we got rid of a sound currency, and we have the government owning way too much. We reward people who don't work. And uh, if, he, if you have a truly free market and a sound world currency, you know, labor and uh, the production of goods and services should be very flexible. It would, it would be similar to what you, we can do in the United States. We go back and forth and, and sort, sort things out. But uh, we, we don't have that. What we have is, uh, and it's related to the monetary system, because uh, what we did, we finagled this thing out of World War II, like you mentioned, something happened after World War II, and it was it was really the setting up of the Bretton Woods Agreement, where we got the privilege of uh, maintaining the reserve currency, the dollar, but we cheated all along. We didn't maintain the dollar at $35 an ounce. We just printed, and then we bought into the world. And it was natural. If we could print money and spend it around the world, it's going to be cheaper to buy stuff overseas. So we contributed a lot to our own own problems so we can't say oh it's all china's fault because there's an imbalanced trade and, and uh, i think what we're seeing now and which is going to get much much worse is the shifting away from the confidence and trust in the dollar uh, we could get away with that for a long time but we got to export the inflation so we've had less price inflation going on in this country we export our dollars and the people, China and Japan, they just buy up our debt and they keep they, they keep the cycle uh, going. And uh, they uh, then when they buy into our country, there was strong criticism of the Chinese the other day, uh, you know, of uh, of buying buying a company. You know, we we have to prohibit them from doing it. So we have messed up the market economy, and uh, I think we've had the free ride, which is exactly the opposite of what the message we're hearing it's all those people who are cheating us you know we're the richest country in the world have the strongest military ever and we're running the show and and and, and the, you know the administration can up and say what's all their fault we're we're in desperate trouble and it's all the foreigners fault it has nothing to do with the fact that we have a uh, inflated currency high high prices we have artificially high wages which uh, fortunately i think the supreme court might uh, you know help on that on curtailing you know the wage prices but to me so much of it is related to the endorsement and the dependency on a fiat dollar system because then the only thing that really counts is do you get the money from the fed uh, and do you get bailed out by the fed when there's trouble so I think that that is a big problem, and that is, of course, what I've worked on for years is trying to get people's attention on the Federal Reserve. And, you know, I think they are paying more attention. I don't think the Fed's nearly as popular today as it was 30 years ago. So, uh, okay, so I want to talk about the day after the U.S. Let's say, uh, let's lay the cards on the table real quick and, and uh, understand that the reserve currency status has allowed uh, government to build a massive debt load. Um, but it is only sustainable, as you say, since the foreign creditors are also playing this game of hot potato. In five to seven years, the Chinese will boast the world's number one economy based on GDP size. And just a decade later, 2035, their military spending will eclipse that of the U.S. Um, what are the, the war games and simulations and, and what is going on inside of think tanks and, and business strategists in the U.S. Um, when they look at the day after 
uh, the U.S. no longer has the reserve currency status, or even the day that foreign entities do not wish to lend the government money at less than five to six percent for for a ten-year period. What happens when this de-dollarization uh, accelerates, and how does the citizenry, uh, um, you know, get impacted by this kind of? Uh, this is a mind-boggling shift. Yeah, well, we act in this country like like there's no problem out there, and the think tanks. Uh, are all active because they represent the, the strongest of the banking industry and the military industrial complex. So they want more and more and more, and you know, and that's why the uh, military budget keeps going up. And uh, there's all a downside to this, but I think, I think if uh, what you say uh, could be coming, you know, real chaos and, and problems for us, some of it should be good because we have to wake up. The fact that uh, the Soviet system came apart in 1990, that was very good. Uh, they, they had to back away from this total authoritarian communism. So we, we have an artificial system. We don't really uh, believe in sound money. We believe in big government. We do believe in power. And it's so bipartisan. They do. They're only fighting over power, you know, and, and control of wealth and their special interests. But they all support, you know, the funny money system, the banking system. You know, this election they just had in New York, Crowley, he got money from Wall Streeters. He, he was supposed to be, you know, the bad liberal Democrat, and yet he was the one that was t- taking these handouts from, uh, you, you know, big corporations, and therefore it, there was an opening for somebody to challenge it. My big beef is, is, that those problems are out there, and there, there are Republicans and d- Democrats that gave us a system, but then you have the Bernie Sanders coming along and say, see, too much freedom, too much free markets. These guys that believe in, in, you know, the free market and free trade, they've caused all the problems, and they're, and they're getting a lot of attention. You know, they get to control the media. But, you know, in spite of all that, uh, I, I'm still very optimistic that we're making tremendous strides in uh, presenting the case for free markets and uh, checking up on the Federal Reserve, pointing out things. I spent a lot of time on trying to show people why we cannot maintain uh, our military forces overseas. Because one thing is, is we'll run out of money, but one thing, we're going to run out of friends. I mean, telling, telling everybody what they can do in trade and what they can do militarily. We have a foreign policy that, uh, that offers uh, two options. We go to countries that we want to control, and we say, well, we're going to treat you real well. You come here, you do what we tell you, and we're going to send you a lot of money, and most of them do. But if they don't, if they don't obey, you know, such as a Qaddafi or somebody wants to maybe use, uh, use, use something other than the dollar, Saddam Hussein, and then we crack down on them, all of a sudden they find themselves in trouble. Well, th- yeah, we've been doing that. But I think now people are recognizing the economic system is fragile. They're getting sick and tired of our foreign policy, and therefore you're seeing China and India and Russia forcing into doing something else. They're just they're just tired of us uh, pushing everybody around. I, and I think America has great things t- uh, to share with the world. I think that it's been there which made America great, but we have forgotten about it. But if if we want to share that with other people, we have to set an example. We should set an example here what markets are like and what free trade is like. Maybe other people would emulate us. But for us to believe that we are so great and we're always right and we are always the strongest and we are going to force you to do what we want uh, at the point of a gun. We interfered since World War II in 80 different elections. And you think of all this baloney going on, you know, with we got to crack down on those Russians. They might have been t- toying with our election. And, and a lot of that is just a lot of nonsense. But we do it endlessly. Our CIA is involved in every election that goes on. So, but the, the people in the world know it better than the American people here. It's it's like the ants understand that they outnumber the uh, <clears throat> the cockroaches in the movie. Can we discuss the situation with gold and silver using modern technology? Um, it will become much simpler to back a currency with precious metals to to just create trade, uh, everyday trade with uh, with precious metals backing uh, the currency. Uh, I'm not obviously for convenience reasons. People cannot uh, the world economy cannot function on physical transference of of metals. Um, because we live in a very fast digital world, but 
I'm not seeing any progress made on this front, not, nor a, pal a public outcry for it. Sil Silver has almost seemed to have lost all connection with monetary purposes whatsoever. It's trading uh, with a small premium above its mining cost, and it's just industrialized. Uh, and it looks like uh, there's comfortable trading here uh, a tad above these mining costs, not for the $10,000 or $20,000 or $50,000 an ounce, which you know I've, I've been hearing predictions since 2008. Has society reached a point in its development where precious metals are not um, needed anymore, or is there a great lesson waiting around the corner for all these fiat regimes that do not start to accelerate their backing of currencies by precious metals, or to people who just hold uh, cash hoards and you know in, instead of putting them either in short-term debt or stocks or real estate or anything else that is not purely just a fiat currency oh no it's just a matter of, of time if a person understands the necessity of uh, having uh, you know something tangible for money uh, I, I think that it's, it's just a matter of time that, that it will happen uh, you, you mentioned that silver is priced because of its uh, commercial use. Of, and if it didn't, it wouldn't be money. You have to have a commodity that is useful and, and sought after, and gold and silver fits that, that uh, category. But I think that uh, people are already getting ready for this. When it comes to wondering what's going to happen, happen to gold and silver, I think we're sort of like uh, pre-1971 when the whole system broke down. Because that was nothing more than a rig system, but it was easier to rig because we were the only riggers doing it. We were saying we can print money forever, and we would say the dollar's worth $35 an ounce. Well, uh, the market overruled and finally destroyed that. Within 10 years, it hit over $800, you know, trying to find out what the, the real uh, ratio uh, should be. And uh, right now, the, these prices are totally rigged. Uh, the disadvantage is, is that the electronic system makes it easier to do. So if you and I go out and buy Krugerrands or American Eagles, uh, you know, yes, that's important. And uh, I think it's necessary. But if we think our coins that we just bought, uh, well, logically, uh, they, should, they should be doubling in price in two years, you know, and that sort of thing. But no, not if you have the futures markets and the options market and all the interference that they get involved in. I think, but I think our government is involved in the stock market. I think they manipulate that because I think the market, of course, uh, it's not as high as it was at the beginning of the year, but it is still. They manipulate it first by low interest rates, pretending the economy is wonderful, and that's manipulation. But then again, they get in the buy and selling business, so they manipulate the stocks. And just think of the bubble in bonds. Even though the bubble is leaking and interest rates have started to creep up, I mean, someday it's going to be known. That's, of course, when they give up on a dollar and interest rates will explode. Then this system comes down. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, and this is the one thing about human action, you can't predict exactly when uh, people will wake up, although many people for 10, 15 years, matter of fact, Henry Hazlitt said the Bretton Woods can't work in 1945. He says it just doesn't work that way, and, of course, it broke down in 1971. So a lot of people uh, realize this is happening, but they didn't know that what Nixon was going to do on August 15, 1971, and say, hey, we're broke. We cheated. We lied to you. We said it. We, we already cheated American people out in 1933. We said it was worth $20 an ounce, so we took the gold and made it $35 an ounce. So governments notoriously always cheat the people. They protect government power. They protect the power of, of uh, creating money. And so, so therefore, uh, you know, when you buy, when a person buys coins, the way I did it, all I can speak for myself, was uh, I was able to find coins even before 1971, uh, even though it was illegal at the time, you could buy coins that were backdated. So you could get involved in that, and eventually, you know, the whole thing exploded. So I think... Uh, Right now, we're in a period of time like that. I think it's going to happen again. I, I think that, uh, you know, gold has been as high as $1,800. I think when this breaks loose and people give up on the dollar, uh, it, you know, it, uh, it's not relevant anymore because it'll be difficult to, uh, <clears throat> to define a value in a dollar that's, uh, that's collapsing. But, uh, 
I, I, I think it's all, you, you know, a, a government-created mess that we have, but I also believe the market sorts us out. I think there's more people now that understand Austrian economics, and that's what you have to have. You have to have a nucleus of people that can influence, you know, the system later on. Right now, you can't go by the evening news, and you certainly can't go by most of the politicians in Washington, because not only do they not talk about it, they don't have the vaguest idea what to on. I was, I was on the banking committee. I remember uh, bringing the subject up of gold, and one of the members had been on the banking committee for 20 years. She came up to me. She says, Ron, she says, uh, isn't our dollar backed by gold? I mean, they, and she was on a banking committee. So there's, there's, no, uh, there's a lot of conspiracy and a lot of control, but a lot of ignorance, too. Interesting. I, Dr. Paul, I know you're short on time. Let's just touch one last subject. Um, I want to I ask you about current events. Um, what is the Trump policy all about? When you, look, when you take a step back, you look at the vision of where he's trying to steer the country in terms of geopolitical status and economic status and, and where he sees you know, the U.S. in 30 years from now, how he's going to prepare uh, under his control what he can. What what are you, what is going on through his mind? Where is he taking the country? Does he understand um, many of the things that um, that you and I have talked about? Or is he concerned with something else? Because we're seeing a situation where 25 percent of the population in the U.S. is hitting retirement, 33 percent of the country is out of the workforce, and 25 percent of the of the population, another 25 percent, the millennials, are entering the workforce, advancing in the corporate ladder. And you know you we're seeing a huge demographic demographic shift from a baby boomer driven economy to a millennial driven economy. But you have all these unfunded liabilities everywhere: Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, it's a huge melting pot of demographic shift. What uh, what's going to happen going forward? How is Trump um, doing this domestically and, and foreign? If you, if you can talk about any of these subjects, I'd really appreciate it. Well, if I knew that answer, I'd, I might be the only one in the country that understands it because I think it's too hard to understand because I don't think uh, we as libertarians um, think in terms of a basic principle, you know, of, of per, per, uh, a personal liberty and, and no act of aggression against another person, and uh, governments can't do that either. So we come from that principle, and we can figure out everything pretty easily. But uh, the one thing I can say is what he is not. He's not. He does not come from that principle of a libertarian position, though he has at times, uh, you know, instincts that says that you should move in this direction. A little less regulations, not a bad idea, and we agree. A little less taxes. But the, the what you have just described, uh, I have no idea whether he thinks about those numbers. I I think they they believe they're omnipotent. But what about what about the Bernie Sanders crowd and and the ones who are now shouting socialism, socialism? Um, they're either just very very evil or very very ignorant because uh, they said that we, we can give everybody what they want for free, <laughs> you know. And so they're living they're living uh, in outer space someplace, you know. Whatever whatever they need, it's for free. And they, they keep saying, well, uh, as well, uh, raise taxes or something, but they're not falling out. But Trump is in that category. They all fit. They just have a, a different agenda because they, they're all, in a way, modified interventionists, Keynesian economists who predict, who, who argue the case that a managed economy uh, is a good one. People are smart. We send them to Washington. Deficits, we've been taught, uh, do not matter, and you can monetize debt, and it's a perpetual uh, growth machine. And everything, uh, even when it gets rocky, uh, you know, like our bad recession we just went through and still have, matter of fact, all we do is print more money, spend more money, and it'll work out. But I think the numbers you recited about young people coming into the workforce and the people retiring and the debt you know, when, when you can uh, come up with, uh, you know, $22 trillion national, that's a big deal. But the, the bookkeeping is so lousy. Uh, we put $21 trillion into the uh, Pentagon, and nobody knows where I went. There's no auditing of it. So that that is all, you know, going to come to an end. But I can't figure out, you know, I have my program, Ron Paul Liberty Report, and we talk a lot about, you know, politics and Trump and all but um, 
I try I actually try very hard not to say, well, Trump, Trump, Trump is all this. I try to talk about economic policies. And when uh, he does things we like, you know, I liked what he was doing in uh, in Korea. You know, it's time we quit quit this war that we that wasn't a war it was a police state and we've been spending money all these years and we're going broke so we ought to change that but and then i praise him you know for taxes and regulation but when it comes to uh an understanding of trade i don't think he had quite gets it and he has a lot of people in that administration very wealthy individuals who made a lot of money in this interventionist inflationary uh, society and system that we have, so they go along well. In this case, a little bit of a little bit of protectionism is okay. There'll never be a trade war, and uh, there will never be a retaliation of any significance. So uh, I think the only way I personally understand what he does and what Obama did and all the rest, they're interventionists. They're just uh, of a different stripe, and they want to intervene. They just think. I'm a better intervener than you are. I can run the world better than you can, and I can run the economy better, and I can pick the right people for the Federal Reserve, and I can manage the medical care system. It's not like right now, of course, Trump did something good about Medi- you know, Obamacare, but the Republicans have, have uh, been big leaders. When the Democrats couldn't get things passed, the Republicans passed you know, government medicine. So to me, it's a battle between intervention uh, which is authoritarian and non-intervention, which is uh, for for those of us who uh, I call ourselves libertarian, and that is people take care of themselves pretty darn well. If you just leave them alone. Dr. Ron Paul, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, you've seen in your lifetime many changes taking place and have managed to capture both the minds of the young and the elderly voters with your timeless ideas of personal freedom. Um, the website, obviously, is ronpaullibertyreport.com. Beautiful, great interviews, very in-depth, um, and, and we're just happy that you can take the time and, and spend with us uh, today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was nice being with you.